Hi, I'm Rich Ribeiro. The Terrell Fund is committed to educating the public about the need to support New Jersey's infants and toddlers right from the start. That's why we're proud to support the important early childhood programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at Two Gateway. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Johnson & Johnson, NJM Insurance Group, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Fedway Associates, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, your future is in our building. And by Suez, water solutions to meet tomorrow's environmental challenges. Promotional support provided by Insider NJ. And by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato. More importantly, we're coming to you from the Agnes Veras NJTV studio in Newark. Back by popular demand is John Bramnick, Assemblyman John Bramnick. He is the Assembly Minority Leader. He's got a new book out. Now, on public television, we don't like to plug, but there aren't a lot of legislators who have books like this. Why People Don't Like You by the funniest lawyer in New Jersey, John Bramnick. The premise of the, listen, we'll talk about the Murphy budget in a second, but what's the premise of this book, John? The premise is uh, interpersonal skills are important, so I have 200 rules of things you shouldn't do. You should not do? Should not do. Give me one. Yeah, when you shake hands with somebody, yes. don't hurt me. You know, certain people <laughs> want to squeeze your hand so much that I understand you work out, and I know a firm handshake's important, but just don't injure me. I like that. Yeah. And anyway, like if you that. give me a hug, easy on the hug, okay? Hey, don't pull it, okay, we'll leave that alone. Um, speaking of hugging, are you hugging? Watch this transition. This segue. Are you hugging Governor Murphy after, by the way, we're doing this a week after the governor's budget address. Are you hugging him? Listen, cutting some spending, making an arrangement with the CWA, the Communication Workers of America, to, to reduce some health care costs. You like this budget, right? Well, some things are good and some things are bad. What do you like? What don't you like? Well, what I don't like is the fact that we don't cap state spending. We cap, we have a 2% cap on local, on local spending. spending. But in the last two years, in these two budgets, you know, we have spending 9 10% increase. Now, why is state government not following its own laws with respect to what we do with local governments? I, th I think everyone knows we have to cap state government at 2%. But, but, but Assemblyman, isn't it fair to say, and, and most objective analysts have said that the, governor, the governor's budget is pretty tame in terms of spending, and he could have spent or proposed spending a lot more. Well, well everybody can spend more. But what was important here was I think Murphy got some message from the legislature, both Democrats and Republicans. What was the message? Well, last time I think spending went up 7.5%. Yes, it did. He wasn't negotiating with the legislature. He wasn't cutting benefits. So health care uh, benefits, uh, uh, pension for, benefits for public employees. Well, especially health care benefits. So he negotiated a reduction in health care benefits for state employees, which is good. Right. But this is somebody who believes, one, in raising taxes, because he's already indicated he wants to raise more income taxes in a state where we're overtaxed. But on millionaires. So, well, you know, it's funny. If it's somebody else's income tax, then it's okay. But you would agree that people are leaving this state. You would agree uh, that su successful people, many successful people, are leaving the state. And Why? What makes you think that's about taxes? Well, I don't think they're, le I don't think they're leaving for simply because uh, the, the weather's better somewhere else. This is absolutely a serious problem in the state. But let's get back to Murphy for a second. I think Governor Murphy got a message from the legislature that, you know, spending and cutting uh, taxes is important. He just hasn't followed it 100 percent. He's starting to get a little bit of that message. Mr. Simon, do you believe there's support, in, in all seriousness, for the millionaire's tax? It, last year it was a $5 million. Uh, if you earn $5 million or more, I believe you were taxed at a higher rate. The governor, Governor Murphy, has said, and by the way, we look forward to having Governor Murphy right here uh, in NJ TV studios talking about these things, defending his own budget, making his case. He says, look, you know what? We've got to go lower. A million dollars is still a significant income 
and we need that revenue in order to fund pre-K programs, in order, in order to fund more dollars to public schools, in order to have infrastructure projects, in order to do a whole range, and New Jersey Transit, right? He is a big government spender, and he believes, for some reason, that we are undertaxed. This state is the highest tax state in the country, has the worst business climate in the country, and then he's gonna increase taxes on those individuals who create jobs, he doesn't believe this is going to have an effect on people who create businesses here, more regulation on business. He calls it fairness. He calls it tax fairness. Well, if, if we were loaded with cash and we had surpluses and we could do everything we wanted as a government, then maybe some of Murphy's ideas would be appropriate. Right. But not in a state where we have to compete with other states and try to bring businesses in and keep jobs here. Uh, I don't think he gets that part of the message. What about the innovation initiative? He's thought we're doing a whole series on innovation in New Jersey, the future of innovation. The governor has said that it's this innovation state. We need to promote that. And it's a way to promote our economy. Of course. But those innovation companies have to feel as if they can do business here and they can have people live here, that it's not unaffordable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just I want innovation here. I want innovation companies here. If I want innovation companies here, I have to make it affordable to bring in people to work here mm. and for companies to do business here. Assemblyman, what's going to happen? By the way, we're, we're joined by Assemblyman John Bramnick, who's been in the legislature for a few years. Yeah, 2003. 2003. He is the ranking Republican in um, the lower house. Legalizing marijuana. I guess your colleagues call it cannabis in the legislation. It's marijuana. It appears that many of your colleagues are looking to say, listen, we don't really want to even vote on this. We would rather have the citizens of New Jersey make their decision on this. Should the decision to legalize marijuana in New Jersey, Assemblyman Bramnick, go to voters and not state legislators? And if that's the case, are you not ducking this? Well, first, I think the Democrats in the legislature are going to pass legalized marijuana. You do? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they'll probably wait for after the election because they're afraid of the repercussions from that because there are a lot of moms out there who don't believe another drug should be introduced into our society. Respectfully, some of it is, the last poll I saw, saw that mo said that most New Jerseyans are supportive of legalizing marijuana. Well, I'm t I said moms of okay. like teenage kids. And I can tell you, government now is going to endorse another drug with all of the drug problems we have in this country. But let's go back to whether people should vote on it. I'd be happy to see people vote on it. That, that's not necessarily how I would vote. What would, you vote. would you vote against it? I would absolutely do the following. Nobody should go to jail for having small amounts of marijuana. No one should lose their career. But I would not vote to endorse another drug in a society where we have an incredible problem with everything from opiates to alcohol. It's, it's basically government saying, hey, here's another drug you should try. You would decriminalize. Absolutely. But not 100%. legalize. There's a difference? Big difference. Okay. Big difference is I just don't want to endorse another drug. Okay, try this. Um, last time you were here on State of Affairs, you, you're very candid about uh, the tone and tenor. By the way, um, let, Jackie, put up the website, our website. We'll put uh, Simon Bramnick's uh, video. You did a social media hit. I don't know whether it was on Facebook or wherever it was, where you said, look, we need to stop acting like we hate each other and we're enemies. We just have different ideas. And the tone of political discourse is out of control in this country. What was the message and why did you send it? Yeah, I'm really sad about that. Uh, now it seems as if we're enemies on opposite sides of the aisle. I mean, why is it personal? This is public policy. Why is it personal? Uh, Not well, a hypothetical, but well, why is it personal? Well, it's become personal because I think even in the media, you have two sides. You have Fox and MSNBC, and both of them never say anything good about well, the other PBS side. you have PBS where we don't pick sides, well, that, but that's another story. Absolutely, but you're not out there to just try to get ratings. You're, you know, you have public financing. It's a little different model than the private industry. So what's happened today, the only people who get on TV are the people really mad at the other side. If you're in the middle and you're like trying to look at public policy and you're neutral and you're trying to understand, you won't get the, you won't be interviewed by any of those channels. And so everyone thinks you either have to be A or B. You can't be in the middle of anything. And you can, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. That's how you get on there. It, of course, you have to, you have to be radical on one side or the other. And demonize your opponent. Absolutely, and I have to tell you, this is one of the most dangerous mm -hmm. things I've seen in society. My dad used to say, if you said something like the president's a bum, he goes, no, no, you, you don't disrespect anybody in public office. You treat everyone with respect and discuss the issue. You always do that, Assemblyman. By the way, I want to clarify, 
Um, we spend a, lot, a fair amount of our time raising private dollars to do what we do, as you well know. No, um, I understand. It's in terms of government funding. Um, but you're as close to the middle of the road in public television as anybody could be. That's our mission. It and to share well. information. Uh, Senator John Bramnick, uh, one more time. Here's the book. Why People Don't Like You the fun <laughs> by the Funniest Lawyer. He's also the funniest legislator. But I often tell him that wouldn't take much in New <laughs> Jersey. John Bramnick, thank you, John. Thanks, appreciate it. Appreciate it. I'm Steve Adubato. We're at NJTV Studios, the Agnes Vera Studio. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. State of Affairs is honored to uh, welcome our good friend, Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, a Democrat uh, representing what area of the state? 35th District, Patterson, Northern New Jersey. And uh, in fact, have a title and leadership of the Democratic Party, which is? Majority Conference Leader of the New Jersey General Assembly. You dedicated much of your life, not just in the legislature, but uh, as a leader at a major health care system. You are, uh, in fact, Vice President of Hackensack UMC Mountainside Hospital. Much of your focus is on infant um, mortality rates, yes. particularly in the black community. Five times higher than Five whites? Five times higher. One of the highest in the country, just in New Jersey alone. And because? Because we, for... I will say this. Our health commissioner has uh, taken a concerted effort in our first lady. Dr. Tam Elna Hall. Dr. Elna Hall, first lady Tammy Murphy. That's right. Has really taken this under their belt. Since the 90s, we've been in the high, high ranks of infant immortality for African-American women, five times higher. Shouldn't happen. A mother shouldn't have to worry about losing her life and the life of her child uh, upon birth, low birth rates. And we have a, a sundry of issues that really fall into that. And uh, not only as a health care professional, but as a majority conference leader, as a vice chair of the Legislative Black Caucus, we really focused on this initiative. By the way, uh, folks, we'll put up our website right now for an initiative we've been working on for about a year now. It's called Right From the Start NJ focusing on infants and toddlers and those who care for them. Assemblywoman, what does the state need to do more to help protect infants and toddlers and those who care for them? Oh, Steve, thank you for asking that question. Uh, we need to put money with this. So I am pleased that in the governor's proposed budget, $1 million will be dedicated to doulas. We're talking about a relationship with health care professionals for this um, community. Excuse me for interrupting. Sure. Explain who and what doulas are. So doulas are birthing coaches for women who may not have a birthing coach or may not know the questions to ask of their professionals and how to talk to professionals who are caring for them during that sensitive time when they're pregnant. Um, what questions to ask their health care professional. There's something that we learned, uh, which is implicit bias. As much as we teach cultural sensitivity right. in the health care setting, in fact, we do annual trainings, there's still a language gap where African-American mothers are not being heard, whether they're professionals, whether they're in poverty or low-wage earners. We need to make sure that their voices are clear uh, when they're in the sensitive birthing time and that healthcare professionals do not ignore all the complications and questions that they have. So doulas will help support them through that in a healthy lifestyle to carry to full term. There's a bias involved in there, Senator? There is Explain a, that to us. Give us an example there, of what that looks there's like. There's an absolute bias and absolute uh, racism um, connected with an African-American mother giving birth. There is a, a blind spot to the stigmas and traumas that they may face leading up into the birthing cycle poverty, low wage earning, child care for children who may be at home, access to transportation mm. just to get to appointments. Social determinants of health. Social determinants of health, classic examples. And for decades at this point, we've ignored those factors, which has led to us having the highest rates of infant and mother immortality in the state of New wow. Jersey, in all of the states, in our entire country. We're number 48. And I'm embarrassed. Out of 50 states. Out of 50 states. I'm embarrassed that we're number 48. And we can actually do something to mm. change this. Ironically, number 48 in that area, but New Jersey is considered, behind Connecticut, the second wealthiest state Correct. in the nation. So, so we have to work on this issue. Let's talk about this. Um, I'm curious about, when you talk about the governor's budget, 
The governor has called for raising taxes on millionaires. Last year, the budget called for raising taxes on people who earn over $5 million a year. What do you think of raising taxes on those who earn a million bucks or more? So the, the hard part for me, uh, Steve, is the wealth gap and the disparity in the wealth gap in New Jersey. Uh, the poverty rates have increased and the wealth gap has increased. So you have folks who are in that middle class, which is shrinking, that can't give anymore. You can't get blood from a stone. So we really have to look at those earners, which we're talking about approximately 18,000 millionaires that can contribute to the health and the equality, the equitable gap in our state, considering the wealth that's in our state. It makes sense to you. It, it makes sense to me that you worry we, about losing some. Of them? You worry about losing some of those millionaires who say, you know what, <clears throat> I don't have to stay here. I'm going to go to Florida, which you know does not, in fact, have an income tax. Steve, I'm out of here, and then you lose all that revenue. Steve, they have options. A lot of folks here in New Jersey don't have options. New Jersey is home. I, I know folks, especially in my district and throughout the state, who can't just pick up and go. They only have one home. They don't have two homes. Right. They don't have two zip codes. They can't establish residence in some other state. They can't establish residency in some other state, some other country. No tax shelter. How much more can we give? And the federal impact of not having your property tax covered mm. is devastating to folks who are house wealthy in the state of New Jersey. So something has to give. We're talking with Assemblywoman Shavonda Sumter, who is... Uh, uh, a leader in the Democratic Party uh, in the uh, Assembly, uh, represents Patterson. Any other towns, or is it all Patterson? Garfield, Elmwood Park, North Haldon, Haldon, and Prospect Park. So, you mentioned racism before. Yes. President Trump. Does it matter? Well, let me try it this way. Mm. Do you think President Trump has contributed in a positive way to social discourse <laughs> around race? I think that's a, a nice way of saying that. Um, do you think he's a racist? I do not think the president, as the CEO of a great nation, has done enough to uh, unite our United States. <clears throat> has are, he done enough to divide? Um, the, has he divided? The discourse that we face is when we don't speak out as leaders. When you're in a leadership position, you do have that authority and that obligation, I believe, to represent the unity of all and respect for others, especially others of different race and different cultures. Uh, to pit one against the other or not speak out at all, that's a disservice not only to our country but to your oath of office. It, I'm going to follow up one more time. <laughs> when the president said there are good people on both sides in connection with a very highly publicized and polarizing set of incidents, tiki torches, people who are white nationalists, others who are protesting, good people on both sides. Does that help the discussion? Steve, it doesn't help the discussion, but what I am encouraged by is young people who are speaking out, young people who are uniting arm in arm. Even our Jewish youth are speaking out about mm. the swastikas and, and a insensitivity to their story. The same must be said for the African-American plight in this country, as well as any other immigrant who are fleeing uh, uh, detrimental circumstances, not because they don't have love of country or home, but because it's dangerous. There's human trafficking, there's death, there's torture. Let's make sure we have a pathway to citizenship as it has been for generations before us. In Patterson, one of the most diverse communities Absolutely. in the nation, not just the state. Uh, Shavonda Sumter is a leader in the state legislature. She is a vice president, Hackensack UMC, Mount Zed Hospital. Uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Well done. Always a pleasure. We'll be right back right after this. To see more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at stateofaffairsnj.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, Ph.D. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We are honored to be joined by Mr. Edward Dennis, Assistant Vice President, Office of Military and Veteran Affairs, Berkeley College. Good to see you, Ed. Thank you, Steve. It's good to see you, too. 21 years in the uh, Army. Yes. First of all, thank you. So oh, much will. for your service. What was the biggest lesson you took away from that experience about life? About life? That everything has its place and, you know, there's always challenges in life, but if you take the time to, to sit back and look at them, you know, come up with the best plan for yourself, 
then uh, everything usually works out. It's interesting. You talk about plans. We've talked to your colleagues at Berkeley for a long time. I've, I've done some speaking down there. They also mm -hmm. support what we do at, um, with public broadcasting. But what I'm curious about is the transition that veterans have to make, need to make, must make into society and its connection to college. Mm -hmm. You say it, you've yeah. got to make the right choice. Oh, absolutely. What does that mean? Well, there, there's kind of a, a nuance when it comes to that. When you're in the military, you don't know what you need to know as a veteran because everybody's still in. It's when right. you get out that you find out. So what I talk to them about or, you know, what they should really consider is, you know, while I'm in there, where do I want to go to school? And then really think about the school. Does it line up with what you want to accomplish education-wise? And is it, you know, your learning style and the environment you want to be in? And then really put the research and time into picking the school you want because, you know, some veterans will just get out and they'll, they'll follow the... The, uh, the theme, you know, go to college, get a degree, get a job. But it really matters what you do while you're in college. How'd you do it? I'm a little different. I went in, in the military when I was 17, out of high school. And uh, like most veterans, almost 90% of veterans, I'm first generation to go to college. First? Yes. Was it part of the plan for you? Sort of. When I, when I was a private in basic training, and uh, I realized this wasn't too much fun, I thought about going to college. Well, how'd you make the decision as to where to go, though? In the military? No, no, when you were getting out and going to college. Oh, oh, How did you was, do your research? Mine was a little different. I left the military with an MBA. You, but, oh, <laughs> wow, you left. So yeah. you're the exception. Yeah, I'm a little bit out of the norm. That, how did you know to get an MBA? I want to have a job when I retire. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a planner. Yes. And you also are telling me before we got in the air that you do a lot of coaching of mm -hmm. veterans. What kind of coaching do they need? Well, I talked to them about their grades, um, you know, how important their grades are. So I write a letter every semester for all the students to get A's, which is kind of interesting. The first time I wrote it, it was about 24 letters. Um, this last semester, there were 68 letters that I wrote. Mm. And uh, what I found is, you know, just that little trick. I think Napoleon said something about a piece of, of cloth. You know, a man will do anything for it. It's true. You know, you take veterans and you give them something small. For example, I have my pen on me. This was the first gift that I gave veterans. They get a little gift like that. It's a pretty nice pen. You can keep it. Thank you. And then... Uh, Thank you you know, key chains and other things, but all of a sudden I see their grades are going up and then they become competitive with each other and they want to get good grades. But it's to highlight that point, you know, work on your grades sure. and do well in school. But the other thing that strikes me, and we've done a fair amount of programming, um, dealing with challenges that veterans face, I'm curious from your perspective, the top three challenges that veterans face making the quote transition back into society. Okay, okay. top three. I'll say the first one is, you know, the, the lack of structure. When you're in college, you know, you're, it's just different. A lot of the instructors, if you come to class, you come to class. If you don't, you don't. That's, right. that's your choice. And that's across colleges. You know, they keep attendance, but they're not going to make you come to class. It's not high school. No, it's not being in the military. It's not. <laughs> You're totally going to be different. out of time in the military. And the support structure is a little bit different in the military. If you have a question in the military, you know, you ask your supervisor. And then if he or she doesn't know, they ask their supervisor. And it's a very short amount of time before they get to somebody very senior that can answer that question. It's, uh, you know, and this kind of goes into the second one, the... You know, just finding the resources available to you and which ones fit what you're trying to do is probably the second most challenging piece. Mm. And then the third one is just staying, staying on point, just keeping motivated. But, you know, in the time we have left, I'm curious. I said this to you also before we got on the air, that there's mm -hmm. some misconceptions about veterans. Some people believe veterans are just broken. I mean, could, there's yeah. no way you could serve and come back and not be broken. I'm, that's the air quotes, you know. That's true. There, there is a lot of misconception out there that veterans are broken. And, um, you know, some of them have had challenges. You know, we've done things that aren't, you know, done in other parts of society right. to serve our country. You know, but in doing those things, that doesn't make everybody broken. It means, you know, they, they've had some challenges and, you know, they can put it back in order. If, say, for example, they have PTSD. You know, there's, there's, there's um, everything out there to help them out. And a good example is, if you look at PTSD, the highest category for folks with PTSD is not veterans. It's not? It's car accident victims. And car accident yeah. victims yes. over veterans. Yep. And then, you know, you have law enforcement and other folks that have traumatic experiences. But, you know, in, in today what we're looking at, we see a, a, a lot of uh, veterans, right. but veterans are less than 1% of the population. Yeah. Real quick before I let you go. Um, grades. Uh, veterans and grades versus non-veterans and grades in college. Institute's interesting study out of University of Military and Veterans, or I'm sorry, the uh, Institute for Military and Veteran Families at sure. Syracuse University. Um, they did a study and found that the average GPA for veterans is 3.34. 
non-veterans is 2.94 in the United States. So it's higher for veterans? Yes. Um, real quick, 30 seconds left. Number one leadership lesson that you have learned um, from your life in the military and beyond is? In order to be a good leader, you have to be a good follower, which means you have to you know, take in what other people have to say. And as a leader, you're really you know, a servant to, to those that work for you, that you're leading. And if you take that with you, it's amazing what people will accomplish. Edward Dennis he is Assistant Vice President, Office of uh, Military and Veteran Affairs, Berkeley College. I want to thank you for being with us and once again for not just your service to the country, but what you continue to do for other veterans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Well it's done. a pleasure. This is State of Affairs. I'm Steve Adubato, and we'll see you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 30 years of broadcast excellence. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is brought to you from the Agnes Veris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting right from the start NJ, Johnson & Johnson, NJM Insurance Group, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Fedway Associates, Keystone Mountain Lakes Regional Council of Carpenters, Suez, and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State. And by Employers Association of New Jersey. Education begins at birth. The brain develops most rapidly from birth to age three, when critical skills are developed. Parents are the first and best teachers for their children, but for those like me who work, Finding quality, affordable childcare can be challenging. But children have the greatest opportunities for success when they learn and have positive interactions with their caregivers. Because learning doesn't start in the classroom, it starts in the cradle.